So welcome back. Uh, we arrived to the to the last tutorial of the day. Uh, it is will be given by Joel Moore and and it's on unique electromagnetic properties of topological semi-metals and insulators. Uh, Joel is a is a professor at the physics department at University of California Berkeley since 2002. Uh, he is also a Simon Investigator and elected fellow of, of the American Physical Society and the current holder of the Chern Simon Chair in Mathematical Physics. He's a, also a senior uh, faculty science, scientist at the Lawrence uh, Berkeley National Laboratory. His main research interest is in the properties of quantum materials in which electron and electron inter interactions of wave function topologies yield uh, new states of matter. Uh, very relevant for, for this uh, conference, of course, is that he recently published a book on topological phases of matter uh, together with uh, Roderick uh, Messner, and this was uh, published actually this year in Cambridge uh, University Press. So I will let uh, Joel start. So welcome and thank you for, for joining us uh, from uh, the West Coast in the US. Yes, thank you very much for having me. And uh, it's morning here, so I realize you had a long day. I'll try not to be too uh, technical in some parts. Um, so let me go ahead and see if I can share my slides and uh, let me know if there's any technical problem. All right, can you see my first slide? Yeah. Perfect. OK. Um, let me actually just arrange windows so I can see, uh, I can see the chat uh, if anyone puts any questions in there, and I'm trying also to call up the Q&A, sorry. All righty, so yeah, the, uh, the point of this talk is basically to give, first of all, a tutorial on uh, one way of looking at topological phases, which has the advantage that it leads very directly to thinking about how they respond to electromagnetic fields. And the historical example of that is the quantum Hall effect, which you just heard about in the last talk is very useful from for metrology, aside from being a beautiful piece of physics. Uh, so I want to, in the first part of the talk, um, explain the Berry phase understanding of, of why that happens and, and other related topological phases in insulators. And maybe uh, to tell you something that you haven't heard before, even if you have heard about the Berry phase and churn number and a few other things, uh, I'd like to talk about how the magnetoelectric effect works, which is maybe the first example um, in a fairly old fashioned materials property of how it's actually controlled by the non-abelian Berry phase and some other interesting mathematical objects. Um, so I don't think it's particularly complicated. I'll try to make it accessible and uh, we will have some time for questions. Of course, if there's anything urgent, then just put it in the Q&A and I'll try to respond uh, quickly. Um, so, the second part of the talk uh, is going to be about semi-metals, um, which are discovered only recently, these topological semi-metals and how they do have some interesting properties. And I'll give you one or two examples uh, early in the talk to kind of warm up for that. Um, but I thought it'd be good to talk about something research level, uh, not purely a tutorial, although I guess some of these papers are now a few years old. Um, so the second 30, 35 minutes will be about semi-metals and that will include these sort of research papers I have on the title here. And what I want to build up to is what may be the first example of a quantized nonlinear effect um, observable in experiment. So with dropping indices, the quantum Hall effect would be the equation on the left. And you could ask just by power counting, are there any materials that would support some kind of effect like on the right here? Um, and we'll come to that later on. So as I said, the way I've divided up the lectures, the first one is on insulators and the second one is on semi-metals. Um, and the thing I like about both of these is that uh, once you learn a couple of mathematical uh, objects, the so-called Berry phase gauge fields, which I will spend a few minutes on, even though I suspect many of you have heard about them, um, an enormous number of topological materials can be accessed in that way. And that's true uh, even if you're not focused on low frequency adiabatic transport, which is usually where topology shows up. It turns out that even some optical properties um, these are the right mathematical objects to understand solids in terms of. Um, that's relatively recent. So that's why I do think um, as new solid state textbooks come out, for example, they do start to incorporate this idea of Berry phases and wave function geometry and so on. So with topological semi-metals, it's actually turned out to be quite difficult to find uh, unique electromagnetic responses that only happen in topological semi-metals and not really in other materials. 
Um, but we now have some examples that are uh, nonlinear optical effects. Um, so maybe the general question to sort of keep in your mind is uh, how are lecture one and lecture two connected? And in particular, how is quantization different uh, in an ideal semi-metal? In other words, one where the Fermi surface is just a couple of points. Um, maybe it's surprising that there could be quantization at all, but how is it different than it is in insulators? Um, and it's probably good to say what I mean by quantization in rough terms and then in sort of philosophical terms. And then at the very end, I'll try to just fit how these electronic systems fit in the, the universe of all topological phases, theoretically speaking. So here's a quick example why um, it's not crazy to think that semi-metals might have effects that are quantized, uh, not at the level that you could use it for metrology, not part per billion, say, but at least at the level that some measurable response uh, is actually controlled by material independent parameters. Um, so what I mean by that is I don't have velocities or energy gaps or something like that. Instead, what I have are just things that are material independent constants like E and H and so on. Um, so the maybe simplest example of that that I can think of is not especially topological, um, but if you take graphene, two-dimensional semi-metal, and you hold it up to the light, you can do maybe the easiest experiment to measure the fine structure constant, at least approximately. You'll find that the graphene is mostly transparent in the visible. About 2.3% of the light gets blocked, and that 2.3% is pi times 1 over 137. In other words, pi times the fine structure constant, and it's the fine structure constant in vacuum. It's not it doesn't involve the velocity of graphene or anything like that, the velocity of electrons in graphene. Um, so that's at least an example that if you're willing to ask the right questions and if you don't need incredibly perfect quantization, that semi-metals might be interesting. They might have uh, some unique physics and that's gonna be the motivation for part two of this two-part lecture. Um, for part one, let me maybe uh, you know say, uh, before we get to the uh, traditional physics of insulators, why people first cared about vial semi-metals from like a particle physics point of view, because they're gonna be the hero of part two, um, but then why they're actually important from a condensed matter point of view. So the, the original reason maybe for caring is that the low energy electrons in these semi-metals are like three dimensional versions of graphene. And in particular, they have a kind of massless fermionic particle, the version of the electron in these materials is not there in the standard model of particle physics. Uh, so historically, people hoped that the neutrino would be an example of this Val fermion, but it turns out not to be. Um, but leaving aside the idea that there's a new kind of particle, they're even practically interesting. If you take tantalum arsenide, which is sort of the benchmark Val semi-metal, uh, I will show you some data later on that even just standard nonlinear optical properties are extremely strong, and depending on how you measure it, uh, as strong as in any other material. Um, in this tantalum arsenide. So that's uh, maybe a sign that nonlinear optics is interesting. And it turns out that it also allows you to do a, a, this first example of a quantized nonlinear effect, in fact. Okay, so now going back a bit, and, and these are all the people that are involved in the research part, and there are a lot, and most of them are people who passed through Berkeley at some point, especially in the top line. Um, Fernando is, is now in Spain and Donostia, uh, let me mention, and then um, the experimental collaboration whose data I'll show was kind of spread around uh, various places. Uh, Joe Ornstein is my Berkeley colleague. All right, so now on to the, the more tutorial aspect of what is this Berry phase object I've been talking about? Why is it important? But first, what is a topological phase um, and why might you be interested uh, aside from practical purposes? So the way I would motivate it is if we go back to, you know, what are the basic things you learn about condensed matter physics? Well, symmetry and symmetry breaking uh, are sort of the bread and butter of a typical graduate education in condensed matter. And we know that we can understand a great deal of things, not just crystals, but magnets and so on, um, by analyzing symmetries and how maybe at low temperature, a material has fewer symmetries than it does at high temperature. Um, an example that will be relevant later on and that you've already heard about is that magnets don't just maybe pick out a direction in spin space. There's also a sense in which they break time reversal symmetry. Um, but this is more than just you know, philosophy, this idea of symmetry breaking. It leads to some amazing predictions, which uh, usually we call universality of second order phase transitions. Um, and this is what made me want to be a condensed matter physicist when I was in graduate school. 
As an example, if you look at the liquid gas transition in something like water, just boiling, um, then if you go up to high enough pressure and temperature, that difference between liquid and gas disappears. You can measure the density difference, say, and you find that it disappears as a power law of temperature. If you look at an Ising magnet, sort of an ideal theorist's Ising magnet at least, and you go up near the Curie point, you find that the degree of spontaneous magnetization disappears. And an amazing fact, which took a very long time to understand, is that these numbers beta are actually the same, even though these are very different experimental setups. One is a liquid, one is a solid, one is classical, one is quantum spins. Um, somehow close enough to the critical point, those differences don't matter. And I think one way to understand why we care about topological phases in theoretical physics is that there is a, a similar kind of universality. Um, and again, the, the great example of this was the integer quantum Hall effect where um, you make a two-dimensional sample, put on a magnetic field, run a current, measure the transverse voltage that builds up, and you find an amazing thing that the Hall conductance or conductivity uh, is quantized to incredibly high accuracy. And it's universal in the sense that you get E squared over H, whether you're doing it in gallium arsenide or graphene or whatever. Uh, it doesn't really have any material dependent numbers that appear. And this is what led to the sort of very phases of solids that I'm going to talk about. But it's worth saying that the original explanation of this effect, which you still might have learned in class, say, by Laughlin, um, it's a little bit less clear you know, how that would work in an ordinary crystal, how the Berry phase comes in and things like that. So what I'll try to tell you very quickly is kind of an alternate picture from what you learn, but it's this Thaulis picture or Thaulis Berry picture that winds up being good for topological insulators and antiferromagnetic topological insulators and many, many other things. Um, so this uh, extraordinary accuracy, I believe is limited to insulators and maybe superconductors, um, but at least the idea of these material independent scales for physical effects, um, that's kind of the focus and that can happen in semi-metals as much as in insulators. So maybe just to explain how the symmetry that we always talk about is related to topology. Um, let me give some examples and actually uh, use optics because that's something that maybe people don't normally think about but will come up in the second part of the talk. So symmetry in general tells us whether an effect is allowed to be there. And if it's allowed to be there, then it should be there. It would require fine tuning not to be there. Um, but what topology or, or geometry of the wave function in general um, that can give us some magnitude for the effect that is surprisingly insensitive to disorder or microscopic details or whatever. Um, so in optics, maybe terms I'll start using later on, just in case you haven't heard before, uh, I think of a material as breaking inversion if it has second harmonic generation along at least some directions, like gallium arsenide. Second harmonic generation means light comes in at frequency omega and some light comes out at frequency two omega. Uh, polar materials are the subset where I don't just break inversion, but I actually have a preferred direction. That's like what you would want for a solar cell, say. And the chiral material is one that has like a screw or a handedness. Um, that would mean there are no mirrors and I can have optical rotation even if I don't break time reversal symmetry um, in transmission. So a bit like a Faraday effect, but not in a magnet. So these are different kinds of symmetries that matter for optical response, but in general, optics has not been thought of much in terms of berry phases and things like that until the last few years. Okay, so the, the berry phase I'm about to introduce, here's what I meant by saying that uh, it's useful everywhere, uh, or at least in a whole lot of different solid state properties. So I'm going to write down some objects in the Brillouin zone that have the same mathematical structure as like the electromagnetic gauge field that we think about all the time. Um, they, we even use the same symbols like A for the vector potential and F for the field strength. Um, but it turns out that pretty much any allowed gauge invariant object I can make out of these Berry phase gauge fields has some physical consequence or meaning. Uh, the original example was the two-dimensional quantum Hall effect. So these are topological phases. Um, there are other cases where you get quantization or a topological phase if you have some requirement of symmetry, and that's these topological insulators say. Uh, but it turns out the Berry phase is a lot more important than just these topological phases, actually. Even standard quantities like electrical polarization of a solid were not fully understood until people understood the Berry phase. Uh, 
And the modern example I wanted to talk about because it kind of ties everything together and involves some new aspects also is the magnetoelectric effect. And in fact, the, uh, the kind of crystals that Mikhail talked about earlier are examples of a quantized magnetoelectric effect or axion insulator. Um, so this is maybe the magnetoelectric effect, I would say, is the, the most uh, surprising or interesting to me case of the insulators. Um, but then we'll move on to metals. Um, and in metals, there are a lot of old measurements, uh, like, for example, the measurements that Hall did on the Hall effect that, are, that have a berry phase part but are not really quantized. So we'll start with those and then talk about the quantized ones. Um, but first, OK, let's make uh, an argument for why certain physical properties might wind up being quantized in solids. Uh, and the way that happens mathematically is easiest to picture by just thinking about surfaces. So if I give you a surface in three dimensions, at any point on the surface, there are two radii of curvature in perpendicular directions. And one important combination that we make out of them is the Gaussian curvature, one over the product. And that Gaussian curvature can be, it has a sign the way we define it. So a sphere is positive curvature, while this hyperboloid would be negative curvature. So the idea of the Gauss-Binet theorem is that if you integrate this local geometric quantity, the Gaussian curvature, you get what we would call quantization uh, or what a mathematician would call a topological invariant. So the statement is that the total curvature of a closed two-dimensional surface is quantized. So if I take the sphere, this is surface area, four pi r squared, Gaussian curvature, one over r squared, and the integral gives me four pi. And it doesn't care about the radius of the sphere, but in fact, it's still four pi, even if I turn the sphere into a football or something like that, American football, I guess, or an egg, uh, some other shape without cutting it. Um, but if I took the torus that has negative curvature on the inside and positive curvature on the outside and they cancel out and the total curvature of the torus is zero. So now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to make a local geometric quantity and integrate it and get quantization or a topological invariant. Um, so first, how do we make a local geometric quantity out of quantum mechanical wave functions. Um, and the original example of this, which is worth doing as an exercise if we had more time, uh, was maybe most clearly explained by Barry. Uh, and the idea is that the adiabatic theorem in quantum mechanics is only a piece of the story. If you have a slowly evolving Hamiltonian and a non-degenerate state, then if you start in that state, you will remain in that state. That's true, that part of the adiabatic theorem. Uh, but there's another piece, which is that if you take the Hamiltonian slowly around a closed loop in parameter space, you'll actually build up a measurable phase. It doesn't really depend on how fast you went around the loop in parameter space, um, but it does depend on what are the wave functions at each value of the parameter. And in fact, this Berry phase phi, we can write as an integral along the path of some object made from the wave function at each point in parameter space. And one thing you might wonder is, you and I could disagree on the wave function at each point in parameter space because we might, there's no reason why we'd agree on the phase. We know that an overall phase in quantum mechanics is not directly measurable. Um, and that's actually why we write it like a vector potential. Um, so if you want just an example uh, to work through, once I've said a bit more, you know, that will kind of convince you, I guess, that this is true. If you take a two level system like a spin half and put it in a Zeeman magnetic field, and imagine taking the Zeeman magnetic field around directions on the sphere that enclose some area, you will find that there is a Berry phase that builds up, which is proportional to the solid angle or the area of the sphere that is enclosed by the directions of the magnetic field. Um, so that's maybe an example. If, if what I'm saying sounds interesting enough that you want to work through something, that's an example you could try on your own time. Um, but the way we use it for solids is, uh, well, let's first explain why it can be physical or, or what things made from A can be physical. Um, so I said there's a kind of phase dependence, which means I might choose psi and you might choose some different phase convention. Uh, well, then A changes by a gradient, which if you remember is exactly how things change in electromagnetism. Um, so our reason for saying that is that just like in electromagnetism then, uh, whoops, we can uh, make objects out of A that don't change, that are gauge invariant. Um, so the 
simplest examples of that are the curl of A, which we now call the Berry curvature. And it's the Berry curvature that's analogous to the curvature of the surface. If I integrate this over a band, something kind of magical happens. Uh, but before I get to that, one little note is you might say, well, what if I had more than one band? We often have degenerate bands and things like that. Well, I just need to add band indices. Um, but then mathematically, you get a so-called non-abelian vector potential or non-abelian connection. Um, and until recently, or at least until 10 years ago, it wasn't clear that this was a very important thing in solids. And now it does turn out to be important for a couple of physical effects. So let's go back to the abelian case. F is curl of A. A is made from the wave functions. What good is that in solids? Uh, well, it's got important stuff, important consequences, both in insulators and in metals, uh, maybe even more important in metals, but let's start with insulators. Uh, and this is what Thaulis did because Thaulis's challenge was Laughlin had this beautiful pumping argument for the integer Hall effect. Um, but Thaulis wanted to explain, you know, if I, if I didn't have pumping, if I just thought about ordinary calculations of conductivity with like the Kubo formula, uh, how would the magic answer pop out? You know, how can I get a quantized Hall conductivity out of the standard formula for conductivity, which doesn't look like it's going to give you anything quantized, uh, et cetera. So the idea was, okay, well, write down the wave functions in a crystal. So now we're using Bloch's theorem. Um, UK is the periodic part. I can make Berry curvature out of that. And if I integrate the Berry curvature over the 2D Brillouin zone, and now these are wave functions in the magnetic field. So they kind of know that the magnetic field was there, it broke time reversal and did other things. Anyway, the integral of the Berry curvature over a band is always an integer and that integer is the churn number. Um, so that was the first example of, of quantization. Uh, what that churn number means or TKNN integer is another term is that if I fill that band up with electrons, it tells me how much that filled band contributes to the integer quantum Hall effect. So that was the uh, first example of this kind of wave function geometry, the Berry curvature being integrated and giving you something quantized that you could measure and nowadays even use to define units and things like that. Um, so now I'm going to go very quickly. One reason for caring about the Berry phase is that you can go through uh, other kinds of materials and ask, do similar things happen? And one that's been topical for a while is uh, the topological insulators. So I'll just have two or three slides on defining those um, because the three-dimensional topological insulator, understanding that is sort of what triggered these studies of the magnetoelectric effect in general. So I think you, you, you might've heard about these even in earlier lectures, but basically just like in the quantum Hall effect, we can now change the physical origin of the phase, but do roughly the same mathematics. So instead of thinking about an external magnetic field, I just want to think about spin orbit. Um, so spin orbit is there in, in almost all crystals and it modifies the wave functions. And in a very rough sense, it looks like a magnetic field that depends on spin. Uh, so what I mean by that is let's think about L dot S like in an atom where L is orbital angular momentum and S is spin. Uh, well, if I just focused on L Z S Z, then this would be like if spin was up, it would be a momentum dependent force, which is a magnetic field, except that if spin was down, it would be like the magnetic field pointed in the opposite direction. Um, so people were able to cook up models uh, like quantum spin Hall effect or two-dimensional topological insulator. Those are the same thing where you would have basically two copies of the quantum Hall effect, one with edge modes going one way and one with edge modes going the other way. And something I I won't be covering because there's in time is that usually when you have a topological invariant in the bulk, it means that there's some kind of metallic state at the boundary. Um, and in fact, often in experiments, that's what we look for. So anyway, this at first was not taken very seriously until 2005 or so, because we all thought that if you added a bit of disorder, you would scatter the left mover and the right mover at the edge and you would get an insulator. But it turns out there is a kind of protection only if there is an odd number of edge modes. Um, and that's the two-dimensional topological insider. So for this talk, I'm going to focus on, in the next couple of slides, the three-dimensional topological insulator and how understanding that leads you to a picture of the magnetoelectric effect in all materials. So the three-dimensional topological insulator, a bunch of people, including Leon Valens and me, were thinking about how to generalize that work of Kane and Melita 3D. And everyone agreed quite rapidly that in three dimensions, uh, 
You can also have a 3D topological insulator whose surface state is like half of a normal metal in that if I look at the Fermi surface, there's only one Fermi surface instead of, or only one sheet of the Fermi surface instead of an even number like a normal metal has. When I say a normal metal, I mean that once you include spin, in the simplest case, there would be a spin up and spin down state at the same energy. I'll count that as two sheets. Uh, if I thought about spin orbit coupling or something, I would split them, but it's still true that with time reversal at every energy, there are an even number of sheets, except in this three-dimensional topological insulator surface state. Um, and that leads to things like spin momentum blocking and so on. Um, so that was our original picture of what is the three-dimensional topological insulator, the so-called strong topological insulator. It's something with an odd number of Dirac cones is the easiest way to state it. Um, and that was a bit of a surprise. So for example, graphene has four Dirac cones, the way we count it. It's got a twofold valley degeneracy and a twofold spin degeneracy. Um, so this is like one quarter of graphene. Uh, so it turns out that there's a different way to look at this state, which particle physicists thought about in the 1980s. And it answers the question of what's quantized in a topological insulator. Uh, because we said in the quantum Hall effect, the Hall effect is quantized. So in a topological, sorry, in a topological insulator, it took a while to figure out uh, what is a quantized electromagnetic response, but then it turned out that some of that had been worked out quite a long time ago. Um, and the idea, which sounds bizarre, but I'll try to convince you that it's true in condensed matter language, was that if you go into a solid, uh, we knew that if we broke inversion symmetry and we broke time reversal symmetry, like in multiferroic materials or magnetoelectric materials, we could have terms like E dot B or E cross B or whatever, but E dot B is actually special because it's a total derivative uh, in electromagnetic terms. It's the total derivative of A D A. So it turns out that if you have time reversal, then it was pointed out by people like Wilczek that you should really think of the coefficient in front of E dot B as like an angle. Uh, so it's true that it's odd under time reversal because magnetic fields are odd and electric fields are even. Um, but what is an angle that is odd? Uh, what values does that allow? Well, to say it's an angle means it's periodic modulo two pi. Um, so zero is equal to minus zero. That's true. That's certainly allowed by time reversal, but you could also have pi because theta equal to pi is equivalent to minus pi. And you probably heard some of this in Mikhail's talk, but we now believe that um, 3D topological insulators, at least if you could gap their surfaces, which happens automatically in those antiferromagnetic topological insulators for some surfaces, then those are theta equal to pi materials. And what I want to explain quickly is how that hangs together with the other definition I just gave you a second ago, and how that leads to understanding the magnetoelectric effect in all materials. And then we'll be done with insulators and can take a little break. Um, so, Again, what's special about E dot B, if I wrote it out in terms of the field strength tensor, this is sometimes called F wedge F or FF dual. Uh, this mathematical object is very interesting. Uh, you might play around and realize that it's actually the derivative of something. And that's why E dot B, even if it's present in a region of space, it's almost like a boundary term. I can move it to the boundary by the magic of integration by parts and calculus. Uh, so what does that mean physically? Well, here's a picture. And if you, if you don't care about the mathematics on this slide or the next one, then just focus on the picture. What I'm claiming is that an E dot B term in the bulk of the material, which we would normally think of as a magnetoelectric effect, it means I apply magnetic field and I generate electrical polarization, or I apply electric field and I generate magnetic moment. And again, that's been measured since the 1950s. Um, a term like that is actually just equivalent to saying I have Hall effect, sigma xy, on the surfaces of the material, um, because Hall effect is what corresponds to ADA of the electromagnetic field, the electromagnetic turn simons term, as we call it. So anyway, the idea of this is suppose I applied an electric field to a material with Hall effect on its surfaces, then I would get currents running around and those would generate a magnetic field. So indeed, having a Hall effect on the surfaces does generate an E dot B term. But now what does it mean to say that theta could be uh, an integer or half an integer allowed by time reversal. Well, uh, sorry, zero or pi allowed by time reversal. Well, pi would correspond to a half integer Hall effect on the surfaces. Um, so this sounds bizarre because I just told you that a topological insulator is something with gapless surfaces. 
Well, imagine we could gap them by putting on some magnetism, either in the material or an applied magnetic field. Then the claim is that one way to, to say that the surface of the topological insulator is special is that it won't give you integer Hall effect, it will give you half integer Hall effect. Um, so how do we know that's true? Well, there are some neat experiments on topological insulators by various groups, um, but let me tell you an older experiment on graphene to try to convince you that there's something special about Dirac fermions and the Hall effect. And that is, if you take graphene and you try to measure the quantum Hall effect, um, then at least at moderate magnetic fields, you don't see zero, one, two, three, four times e squared over h, you see a pattern like minus 10, minus six, minus two, two, six, 10. Um, so th what are those numbers? Well, those are four times the half integers. And remember, I told you that graphene has four Dirac fermions. So that means that uh, if I could make one Dirac fermion, it would indeed have a half integer Hall effect, not a integer Hall effect. Um, and then the 3D topological insulator is something that has one Dirac point at each surface or an odd number in general. And that's why it has theta equal to pi, if you want. So that's kind of how everything hangs together. But then you ask, well, OK, now that we know what is the electromagnetic response that might be interesting in topological insulators, let's do what Thaulis did. Let's sit down and try to compute using relatively standard quantum mechanical methods. Uh, what is the electromagnetic response? And what you get is, I think, the first appearance of the non-abelian part of the Berry phase of a crystal. So I, I put a star here because this is the one, I think, mathematically forbidding formula that I have in the talk today. Um, but the statement is that if I ask about just electromagnetic terms generated by being in a topological insulator, so my ordinary unscripted E and B, those are just electromagnetic fields for good old abelian U1 electromagnetism. Um, then there is a part of this, which I could measure by the orbital magnetoelectric effect or polarizability. And if I ask microscopically, what about the electrons in the crystal gave that? It turns out that very similar to that churn number integral, there's something called the churn simons form, uh, a nearly gauge invariant object made out of the Berry connection again, that tells me the magnetoelectric effect. So this is what I mean by saying that after 40 years, it seems like every object that we can make out of the Berry phase gauge fields, uh, if it's allowed to mean something, it does have some physical consequence because you know, this is an object that was interesting to mathematicians and high energy physicists because it is a nearly gauge invariant object made out of the Berry phase. Um, I don't know that people thought about it much in solids, but it turns out to give this theta angle. And the reason why that matters, uh, this is just saying that there's the non-abelian part, um, it's actually part of the magnetoelectric effect in everything. Uh, in other words, if you go out and measure chromium two sesquioxide or various other things, that magnetoelectric effect is governed in part by this non-abelian Berry phase of the block electrons. In general, there are other parts as well. Uh, this is what I mean by saying there are other parts as well. So I've just got one or two little bits on uh, details and then we'll be done with insulators and can start again from the beginning with metals. Anyway, so this is the full orbital magnetoelectric response, which was a very technical pair of papers uh, from around 2010. And the idea is that in general, in every three-dimensional insulator, um, there is a piece, and, and you know, it, it could be that there's no magnetoelectric response, things are allowed to be zero. Uh, but if there is a response, there's one part, which is this churn simons part and is purely geometric, no energy denominators. It's just something about how the wave functions are bending around each other. But then there's an ordinary part as well, which is sort of like what you'd expect. It's got the electric dipole moment and the magnetic moment and some various subtleties and an energy denominator. Um, what happens when you go into a material that has time reversal or has inversion is that the entire ordinary part, which is some full three by three tensor is zero. And all that you're left with is the purely geometric part and the purely geometric part becomes quantized to this magic value. Um, but the magic value is still e squared over h. In fact, for anyone who's ever done ab initio calculations of polarization, uh, maybe we should have thought about this a long time ago because it's sort of known that there's a natural unit of polarization, which is uh, charge in one dimension or in three dimensions, it's charge per area because it's like surface charge density. So charge per area forms a nice relationship with the minimum flux in a crystal, which is one flux quantum per unit cell area. 
the area part drops out and you're left with E squared over H. So in other words, there is a natural unit of magnetoelectric effect, E squared over H, and that's what's really quantized. That's what you're measuring in principle in a three-dimensional topological insulator. So maybe the, the lesson of the story is that in every dimension, E squared over H means something and is measurable. Uh, it's a contact resistance or a one-dimensional channel uh, conductance. It's the Hall conductance quantum in 2D, and it's the quantum of magnetoelectric effect in 3D. Um, and that's the, the most advanced thing I could think to say about insulators from an electromagnetic response point of view. Um, so there, I think I'm at time for the, the first part. Um, I'll take a break. You can take a break too, but I'm going to be here answering questions for a few minutes. So maybe I'll uh, pause now. Is that is that the plan? And then uh, if anyone has questions, please put them in the Q&A and I will try to answer them. Yeah, that, that's perfect. Uh, so anyone that wants to, to ask a question, you can either write it down in the Q&A uh, Oh, there is one now. And also you can raise your hand and ask directly to Joel. Uh, you raise your hand by going to, to uh, the participant list and, and you will have, or you, if you're in the panels, or you will have raise your hand at the bottom if you're attendee. So you have a question. Okay. I see one question in the Q and A, which I can answer. Yeah. Um, so the question is that the nilsson ninomia theorem, uh, which I will say a little bit about in part two, actually in a different context, but it's normally taken as saying that the number of Dirac points in a lattice model should be even. Uh, and what happens in the topological insulator, it, so there's kind of a hidden assumption in the nilsson nirovia theorem, which is that the boundary conditions say at plus X infinity and minus X infinity are the same. So a topological insulator surface state is what's sometimes called a domain wall fermion in particle physics language. What I mean is, if I go back to my, uh, let me see if I can go back to my slab here. If I have the same boundary condition at, you know, up at the top and at the bottom, then what happened is I would have an odd number of Dirac fermions on the top surface, but also an odd number of Dirac fermions on the bottom surface. So the total number, the total number is still even if I have both surfaces. If I tried to make a system with just one surface, then I would have a different boundary condition. I would basically have theta equal to pi at minus infinity and theta equal to zero at plus infinity. Um, so the short answer is it was already kind of known in particle physics that um, at a domain wall, you can have an odd number of fermions, but a domain wall is something that's really changed the system from region A to region B. Um, you should probably go back to region A if you want you know, consistency at infinity. And that's where you get the other um, Dirac point from. Okay, uh, so let me go on. Oh, okay, good. I see. I see a number of questions appearing, so I'll try to answer them quickly. Um, so, yeah. So with translation symmetry, there is a way for the abelian berry connection, uh, and this was done by New Thales and Wu, uh, to generalize almost immediately to the case of disorder and uh, even interactions. Um, and let me try to uh, state what that is. Although actually, I think I might be able to um, call up a slide from another talk, if you'll give me one moment, that would make it easier. So the answer in words is going to be, I want to reinterpret, instead of thinking about momentum as what I integrate over, I'm going to think about flex boundary conditions and integrate over those. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't seem to have handy what I thought I did. Uh, so what I mean is instead of, okay, so, so this is equivalent to the normal definition uh, for the standard non-disordered band structure case. Uh, but if I had disorder, what I would think about is the following. Think about putting my sample on a torus and think about putting a magnetic flux through either of the two great circles of the torus. Uh, so the 
wave function, the ground state wave function will respond to that flux. And I can write an integral, which is now uh, the Berry curvature made from the derivatives of the many body wave function with respect to flux integrated over the two fluxes. And the mathematics is the same. That will still give me an integer, uh, except that now it's an integer made out of the many body wave function on some finite region. And that will still work uh, even if I've got disorder. So we actually do that. It's quite practical. That, OK, there are more sophisticated methods now, but we can do those integrals uh, for the uh, disordered case without interactions. And in principle, it even works with interactions. It's harder for the topological insulator in some other cases. So there is, yeah, so with disorder, the key is to go to the many body wave function and think about sensitivity to boundary fluxes, which is actually another old idea of Thales. So there's an interesting, look okay, at the next question. I'll just try to get through a few. Uh, why is the vacuum topologically trivial? Well, that's kind of an assumption. It's true. So uh, it could be that you know, there, there's no way to define, or you, you have to sort of make a definition of which materials are theta equal to zero, trivial, and which are theta equal to pi, non-trivial. The only thing which is well-defined is that when you go from one to the other, then there have to be an odd number of direct fermions at that boundary. Um, so I'm not sure if I understood the question about, do we have bands with a symmetry that would give crossing at the interface with a topological insulator? Uh, I guess we we could, okay, so at this point, if we ask just about single electron band structures, there are many, many different categories of topological materials now, and almost any kind of surface state that you want seems to be possible. These drumhead surface states are an example of something that seems to be experimentally relevant and quite uh, complicated, but pretty. So um, I, I think it's, it's uh, kind of a, an assumption, I guess, that the vacuum is, trivial in the sense of theta equal to zero, but no physics would change if we redefine the vacuum as theta equal to pi and the topological insulator as theta equal to zero. Um, so then the, the last question I'm seeing at the moment is uh, the, uh, should when is it necessary to use abelian or non-abelian Berry curvature? Um, so there, so far, it seems like, um, okay, I would start with the abelian case and try to answer that. Yeah, I'd say the, the Zach phase and the very phase are basically the same in 1D. That one I can answer quickly. Um, so the it seems like the abelian Berry phase has a simple interpretation, which I will give when I talk about metals in terms of the location of the electron wave function in the unit cell, um, which means that most standard properties like conductivity that involve electrons moving around involve the abelian part. So almost all of the time so far, it's been the abelian part. With the non-abelian case, that winds up being important, as far as I know, just in insulators and not in metals. And for the non-abelian case to be important it has to be either that multiple bands are degenerate or they're all occupied and there are no transitions. So it doesn't really matter that they're non-degenerate, which is what happens in this magnetoelectric case. So they don't have to be degenerate. Um, but uh, I, so I, I don't think there is yet any general rule for which responses have to be abelian and which have to be non-abelian, except that simple current carrying processes uh, tend to be abelian. And then there was one that appeared uh, that I am not sure if I, okay, let me go through. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, so the pi berry phase for topological surface states, I guess um, the uh, one way to understand that is uh, actually to think about two figures that I showed. Uh, if I go to the three-dimensional topological insulator, I, I showed that there is one spin state at each momentum moving along the Fermi surface. And the uh, time reversal means that the spin state at K is opposite the spin state at minus K. Um, and what that means is if I think about the spin moving on the block sphere as I move around the Fermi surface, uh, the spin on the block sphere uh, rotates through a full circle. But remember, um, when you're talking about spin half, one interesting thing about spin half is that a full rotation of two pi gives you a minus one. It doesn't give you a plus one. So you could view the minus one that is the Berry phase of pi as resulting from a spin rotation of two pi and the fact that spin is one half. Or in general, uh, that, that Berry phase calculation of the spin on the unit sphere I showed, um, the, the, once you believe in spin momentum locking, then you will get pi for the Berry phase. Now, 
if I broke time reversal slightly, so for example, if I opened up a gap, then I would move the spins slightly away from that symmetric locking, and then I would slightly modify the berry phase. So one little calculation you can do is that the pi is not perfectly protected once I start to add uh, time reversal breaking perturbations. Okay, good. And I, see, I think I see one hand up, maybe. Yes. Uh, um, I wanted to ask, is there any a simple way to understand uh, why uh, the Berry curvature has in the denominator the energy difference? So, uh, so the Berry curvature becomes uh, important only at the energy degeneracies. Um, well, in general, the, the, the Berry curvature, okay. It starts with the appearance of an energy denominator, but once I've you know, done the right massaging, uh, like in this Berry curvature, there's no energy denominator left uh, here. Like it, it's you know, just the wave functions and this curvature. Um, so I think the Berry curvature in the most important cases like the integer quantum Hall effect, there's really no energetics or energy differences or energy denominator left in the final formula. Um, so the, the, the way the magic works, I guess, is you know, normally when you start off doing perturbation theory, like to calculate sigma xy, there is an energy denominator and there are matrix elements in the numerator, um, but by matrix elements of the Hamiltonian, of the perturbation of the Hamiltonian. But what happened, what, what the calculation Dowless basically did was to cancel the energy difference in the denominator with part of the matrix element in the numerator and be left with something that is purely geometric, so no energies. So in general, I think the Berry curvature um, by the time you get it to the, what we call the Berry curvature, there's no energy denominator left. It, it got canceled out. Uh, so I would say it's geometric and doesn't depend on energy scale. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. So um, are there, yeah, so there's a question, yeah. Are there more gauge invariant expressions uh, made out of the Berry connection that we could look for experimental or observable consequences of uh, is how I'll take the question. And um, probably there are, but they may start getting into you know, very exotic or difficult to measure quantities that are not very natural from a solid state perspective. But I will say a little bit about other Berry phase quantities in metals in the second lecture, second half lecture. Um, but I do think there's work left to do. And in, uh, in particular, I guess most of the focus so far has been on kind of adiabatic transport, but I think we're now starting to understand that there are optical effects and other things where these same geometric quantities can be important. Um, but I, so I guess I, yeah, I, I don't know all the possibilities out there, um, but what does seem like, uh, you know, even some things like this churn simons form of the Berry curvature that I wouldn't have guessed you know, when I was in graduate school, it didn't, it didn't leap out as something that would obviously be relevant to solids. I'll put it that way. It turns out that it's important for a very old property of solids, which is just the magnetoelectric effect. I will mention uh, there's another class of gauge invariant expressions that are like the Berry curvature, but slightly different that are things like the orbital magnetic moment of the electron. And that turns out to be important in metals. Um, so I'll talk about that a bit in the second lecture. So there's still more than what I've talked about so far, but I don't think I don't know of any argument that we are finished, that we found all of them. Joel, I think it's a good time uh, for you to take a brief break or to start the second lecture, whatever uh, you prefer. <laughs> Maybe I'll just get a sip of coffee. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to talk about metals and this is going to start at kind of a basic level because I would say that the effect of the Berry phase in metals is more basic and simpler even than it is in insulators. Um, so why is that true? And, and I can give an answer maybe for, for what quantities would you expect the Berry phase to appear in? Uh, where should you be alert to the fact that maybe just the band structure is not going to give you what you need to know? Um, so I mentioned in passing electrical polarization, which logically might be the simplest Berry phase effect in solids. It's uh, just the idea that if you integrate the Berry connection 
dk. So this integral that I've written out for polarization in one dimension is the integral over momentum of a. Uh, this is a written out in terms of the microscopic wave functions. Uh, it, it took people a long time to realize that this was the, the way to think about polarization of a crystal if you're just given one unit cell. Uh, so that's a clue, though, for what the abelian part of the Berry phase means, because we know that polarization has something to do with where the electron is sitting, in that if I move the wave function, say, a little bit to the left in the unit cell, then that shifts the polarization. There will be a current flowing in the process of moving the wave function in the unit cell, and computing that current is how you derive this formula at the top in the so-called modern theory of polarization. So. Um, if you want a very rough idea, you know, you, you could just by thinking about derivatives of a plane wave or something say that A, the vector potential looks a little bit like position, but the serious way to do it is to say that um, a change in polarization happens from a current through the unit cell. Um, and that current through the unit cell is what you can calculate with a calculation that's very similar to the one Thales did for the integer Hall effect. Now, electric polarization in general uh, is not quantized. It's just a useful thing that some solids have. Like for example, ferroelectrics are materials where you can switch the polarization and maybe uh, those are useful for some kinds of memories and things like that. So how might you have guessed that things like the polarization were not going to be there in terms of the band structure or other simple quantities? By band structure, I mean energy, how energy depends on momentum. Um, and here's a reason why. So suppose you have a crystal like a typical polarized crystal where let's say it's not magnetic, so it has time reversal symmetry. Um, how can you tell that it breaks inversion? Uh, I want it to break inversion so it's allowed to have a preferred direction of the polarization. Um, and the problem is that if you've got time reversal, the band structure will always be symmetric between k and minus k because time reversal is enough to take k to minus k. So in other words, if you look at the band structure of a material like you know, barium titanate or whatever your favorite inversion breaking material is, it will still look symmetric between K and minus K unless the material is magnetic. Um, so what that means is if there are effects like polarization that depend on breaking inversion, you can't just read them off from the band structure, they have to involve the wave function. And at low energy, there are only a couple of things you can make out of the wave function. Uh, so one of those is the Berry phase, and I'll mention what I think is the other important one later on, although I don't have any proof that these are the only two important ones, but they're the, the, the two most important in metals. Uh, so the Berry phase is some measurement of uh, what are the wave functions doing in, in terms of spatial location in the unit cell. Um, and why that's so important is that there's a whole piece of the velocity of an electron in a solid that is missing even in classic textbooks like Ashcroft and Merman. They, to be fair, they kind of have a footnote saying that in inversion breaking materials, things can be more complicated and we won't talk about them. Uh, but since there are a lot of materials that break inversion or break time reversal, you probably should at this point think about the second term and it is starting to make its way into modern textbooks. So the idea of the first term, I think you'll all have seen, this is the equation for how a wave packet moves in a metal. And most of our basic theory of metals like transport, Boltzmann equation, things like that comes from, you know, it, it's built on this sort of equation. I need to know how a wave packet moves. Um, so the group velocity is saying that because there's band structure, maybe the effective mass is modified. There are lots of changes due to that, certainly. The second term is what's called the anomalous velocity. And it's kind of a tragic story where a long time ago, like in the 60s, Karplus and Luttinger knew that this term had to be there, but they didn't have the Berry phase way of explaining it. And maybe people didn't fully understand them or take it that seriously. Um, but now we understand very simply what's going on. Um, so this is the same F I talked about before. And if you want, you can think about F as dA by dK, uh, where A is the connection. So this is like dA by dK, dK by dT, which means more or less that this is like a, a change in polarization uh, in time, which we would expect to give us a current or some kind of velocity. So why is this there? Well, the way to think about it is, suppose that at one momentum, the electron is sitting on atom A in the unit cell, and that at another momentum, the electron is sitting on atom B. Then if the momentum is continuously changing, the electronic wave function is continuously moving, and it's like there's a velocity within the unit cell. So in other words, the group velocity term that we all know about 
is still there if the electron is a point particle and didn't have any structure. But we know that in a crystal, the electron has a wave function, and that wave function might evolve with momentum. And that's the second term. So the anomalous velocity is the velocity within the unit cell. And that matters. The reason why Karplus and Luttinger were thinking about it was to explain the anomalous Hall effect in things like iron, just simple magnetic metals. Um, and it is believed to be important in some regimes of magnetic metals. Um, but then we started thinking a long time ago about what are other effects that would let you see the anomalous velocity maybe more clearly. Um, but in general, the way things work in ordinary metals, as opposed to topological semimetals, is that these geometric quantities can still be important and they can still give you measurable physics, but they uh, maybe don't involve uh, quantization. You know, there's always something that depends on the details of the Fermi surface. Uh, well, let's see if that's still true. Um, so first, the anomalous Hall effect is an enormous field of physics that continues to be important. There's a very nice scholarly review, uh, this RMP from 2011, but as an example of how it's a hard problem, even by the time you get to figure 47, the phase diagram is still speculative and schematic. Uh, but the idea is that if you have a very clean magnetic metal, then things are dominated by Fermi surface transport, scattering off impurities, things like that. That's the skew scattering region. If you have a very dirty metal, things are dominated by localization physics and stuff like that. Um, there's a large region in between though, several orders of magnitude where it seems like the dominant contribution to sigma xy, the Hall effect, is actually the same integral that I wrote down for the quantum Hall effect of the Berry curvature, but the integral is only over the Fermi C, only over the occupied states of the, the band that's at the Fermi level to make it a metal. Um, so that means it won't be quantized because it would be like in that gauss binet example, it'd be like I integrated the curvature over only part of the surface rather than the whole surface, um, which means I won't get an integer anymore, but it is still pretty intrinsic in that it doesn't care about the details of disorder. Um, so that's why we call this the intrinsic part of the anomalous Hall effect. And then everything that does depend on disorder and stuff like that is the extrinsic part. But even the intrinsic part is not quantized unless you are able to make it an insulator and then you get the quantum anomalous Hall effect that you heard a little bit about in the last talk. So the first effect we thought about, and in 2010, uh, we, thought it was interesting, but not quantized. Uh, but I'm gonna give you a, a picture from then because I'm actually going to come back to this effect now that we have new materials, topological semi-metals, and argue that something more interesting happens. But the, the old effect was the following, and this has been measured for a long time. You need a fairly intense low frequency source, but it's not hard in principle. Um, the idea is I want to look at the photocurrent from circularly polarized light and ask about the part of the photocurrent that switches when I go from right circular to left circular. This is sometimes called the circular photogalvanic effect or the chiral photocurrent. And the reason why it's a useful thing to look at if you want to isolate the anomalous velocity is that the ordinary velocity drops out. And let me try to show you why. So let's have the black circle be the ground state electron distribution. If I'm at low frequency, then for a while, let's say the electric force is pointing to the right and the electrons get moved a bit, just in semi-classical transport, uh, they get moved to this gray circle and then they'll have some average velocity. Um, but because the light is circularly polarized, if I wait long enough, the gray circle kind of rotates around the black circle. And in that process, the ordinary velocity averages to zero. But if I choose the right crystal, you know, low symmetry breaking inversion, then the anomalous velocity does not average to zero and you actually measure it in this chiral photocurrent, we think. So we do think it's a Berry phase effect, but it's like that anomalous Hall effect. Uh, it's intrinsic, it involves the Berry phase, but it's not quantized because it's just an integral over some Fermi surface. Uh, so now let's talk about the, the new materials. Uh, and I'm going to talk about both linear optics and nonlinear optics in vial semimetals, uh, even though it, I think the linear optics, it's almost like a, a negative result or a no-go theorem, but you still learn some interesting things. In particular, you learn another key ingredient of the low energy theory of metals. But first of all, um, let me describe what I think is one of the bigger discoveries in topological materials in this decade, as long as you're willing to include metals. Um, and that is the discovery of three-dimensional versions of graphene. Uh, and the idea is that very soon after Dirac uh, wrote down the Dirac equation, uh, 
people figured out two interesting ways to cut it in half. And those two ways are two of the hot trends, I guess, in condensed matter physics at the moment. Um, so one way was figured out by Majorana, and it's what if you had a particle that was its own antiparticle? Like what if the electron and the positron were actually the same thing? And the search for Majorana particles is a big deal in sort of fractional topological phases. But if we're interested in electrons, or at least in, in states where the quasi-particle is roughly like the electron, then there's another way, uh, which Weil figured out, um, which was the following idea. So Dirac's equation is a four by four matrix equation for a relativistic electron. Um, and people have found massless Dirac semimetals, um, sodium three bismuth and cadmium arsenide are, are two big examples, uh, where you've got a three dimensional crystal where let's say the Fermi surface is a point where four bands come together. So it is very much like a 3D version of graphene. Um, what Val pointed out is that something interesting can happen with massless fermions which is that uh, suppose the electron were actually massless, then if it was spinning in say a right-handed sense relative to its motion, let's say if it had positive helicity in one frame, it would actually have positive helicity in every frame because you could never catch up with it. If it's massless, it moves at the speed of light. So there's no way to Lorentz transform and flip its helicity. Um, and what that means is that left-handed and right-handed fermions can sort of decouple and not talk to each other uh, if they're massless. So we thought that might happen for the neutrino in particle physics, but then people discovered that neutrinos actually have mass through neutrino oscillations. We now think the neutrino might be a Majorana fermion, but it's at least not a Val fermion, which means there are no Val fermions in the standard model. But if you had a Dirac point in a solid and you broke either inversion or time reversal, then that has the effect of splitting the four band Dirac point into two two band Val points. And those Val points have a lot of interesting effects uh, that are gonna be the focus of this last part of the talk. But you know, since this is theory by Val from like the 1920s, uh, what's topological about it or what's new about it? Um, let me explain one or two things quickly, uh, which are actually related to how these materials were discovered experimentally. So e even back in the, in the Vial days, uh, people thought about, could you have a solid where the band structure would have these Val points at the Fermi level? It's just a two band linear crossing. It doesn't sound that exotic. Um, well, uh, the one part about it, which is exotic is if you think about what does the Hamiltonian look like at a Val point, you could write it as something like P dot Sigma, where Sigma is like a pseudo spin variable for the two bands coming together. Um, you realize that there is a kind of quantization again around a two band linear crossing. And the way to state that in terms of the Berry curvature, if you like, um, is that if I made a little sphere uh, around the Val point in K space and asked about the Berry curvature of one of the bands through the sphere, I would find that it's like a source of flux or a sink of flux, but either way, it's a monopole of positive or negative Berry flux. Um, so these Val points, and this was kind of, I think, first known in the helium community actually, but Val points have a quantized churn number. Um, now this is a three-dimensional system, so I need to make a two-dimensional integral if I want to integrate the Berry curvature and get something quantized, and the two-dimensional thing is a little sphere around the Val point. Um, so at first you might say, well, that's just a fancy way of thinking about a two-band crossing, but what do we really learn? Well, there was a neat paper around 2010 pointing out that just like in the topological insulator, there is a funny sort of surface state as a result of these Val points. And that surface state is kind of like half of a normal surface state. So in the 3D topological insulator, what we got was an odd number of sheets or an odd number of Dirac points at each surface. Uh, what happens with a Val semi-metal is similar but different. It's a different way of cutting the Fermi surface in half. Basically you get one arc, like half of the Fermi surface at the top and half of the Fermi surface at the bottom. So again, having a, a Fermi surface that is just an arc would be kind of pathological if you just had a two-dimensional material. Here, the key is all the paradoxes are resolved if you think about the other surface. So it's like you took an ordinary surface Fermi surface, which would be some closed curve in the plane, and you cut it in half and you put half at the top surface and half at the bottom surface. And that's a pretty good smoking gun for photo emission. Photo emission, I haven't talked a lot about photo emission experiments, but those were how people discovered the 3D topological insulator. They saw that surface state 
Um, but now you could also look at some three-dimensional semi-metal and ask, does it have what looks like a dangling arc, like half of a Fermi surface on top? And indeed, people see that. Uh, tantalum arsenide was the first example where people saw that there was this Fermi arc evidence. And now, you know, this seems to lead to a lot of paradoxes, but they're actually weird behaviors that are resolved if you think about uh, the other surface. So as an example, something that was measured by my experimental colleague, James Analytis, is what's called a, a, a vial vigil. Um, so you might know if you've ever thought about how do you measure the Fermi surface? Well, nowadays you probably do it with photo emission, but the classical or the traditional way to do it is with quantum oscillations, which is still a very good way to do it if you have a good enough crystal. Um, so quantum oscillations mean you put on a strong magnetic field and that means that the electron basically moves along the Fermi surface. So what happens if you start an electron doing a quantum oscillation along the Fermi arc on the top of the material? Uh, where does it go when it hits the end? Well, the ends of the Fermi arc are the projections of the vowel points to the surface. Uh, basically, the electron moves through the bulk because now there is a vowel point. So there is a bulk Fermi surface point there. Uh, those are the only K points where it can move through the bulk. It, it moves through the bulk from the top surface to the bottom surface, completes its orbit on the bottom surface, and then comes back through the other vowel point. And there is some experimental evidence in a thin slab of, of well, actually Dirac material, but that, that something like this effect is happening. Um, so what we did not understand, despite a lot of effort until the last couple of years was uh, what is a measurable bulk electromagnetic consequence of these vowel points in the same way that we have, say, now the quantum Hall effect or the magnetoelectric effect? What would you measure that would let you know that a material had vowel points in electromagnetic response? So again, I want to imitate what's done with graphene, where graphene, I don't think of it as topological, but it is true that graphene does have a measurement of the fine structure constant just in its transmission fraction. Um, and it's in the visible, so you can do it with the naked eye. Um, can you do something similar with valsum metals? How would you measure, you know, what property would you measure? What would the frequency range be? And so on. So that's kind of our, our goal. Uh, so we need to back up a bit. Um, now, so there's a question earlier about the nielsen neumia theorem. Let me apply that to uh, these vowel points. Um, so first, since particle physicists had thought for many years about vowel points, let me tell you something that they had realized was special about vowel points, which is very tempting, but then you realize that in condensed matter, strictly imitating it is going to be impossible. So you have to think a little bit about what's the closest you could get. Um, so the neat thing that is known from particle physics is that a single vowel point is what's called anomalous. Uh, normally in electromagnetism, we have a conservation of charge. Uh, if you took a single vowel point and coupled it to electromagnetic fields, so like of a, a vowel point of a charged particle like the electron, you would find that charge conservation can actually be violated. You could apply parallel electric and magnetic fields and your system would spontaneously create or annihilate charge. Uh, so maybe it's a good thing that we can't do that, um, but this is the fact that we can't do it is a consequence of this nielsen ninomia theorem, which says that the total charge of all the vowel points in the crystal at all different energies, so I need to integrate both over momentum and energy, the total charge is zero. So for example, if I go back to this picture, there's a reason why I drew one positive and one negative vowel point. In general, I could have many more, like tantalum arsenide, for example, has 24 vowel points at the Fermi surface. Um, I think 12 positive and 12 negative. Um, so, but they do all cancel out, which is good because it means that you might think when I apply parallel electric and magnetic fields, uh, I will create charges at the pluses and annihilate charges at the minuses. But the right way to think about that in condensed matter terms is that you're kind of pumping uh, charge from the negative points to the positive points. And that's the so-called chiral anomaly. People have done experiments looking for that, but the experimental situation is actually pretty complicated, basically because when you apply electric and magnetic fields, that's like a second order transport experiment. And there are a lot of other effects that could be going on. So, so far there are a lot of suggestive experiments looking for that parallel E and B effect, but uh, nothing that I would say is really a clear smoking gun. Um, but one thing you might like about the chiral anomaly is, um, yeah, because it involves the second order in field, uh, it is a little bit different from what we, we normally think about. It's true that 
Like to make the quantum Hall effect, you need to apply a magnetic field, but the magnitude of the magnetic field doesn't appear explicitly in the formula. So it is different. Um, so if you were just to ask, you know, sit down and think about units, uh, what kind of effects would you expect at second order in field? Well, um, the quantum Hall effect at first order uh, is like E squared over H times electric field. If you wanted one more power of electric field, you could write something like this, except you would now have a change in time of a current density. And another thing you could do would be something like the chiral anomaly. If you change this electric field to a magnetic field, then you would have dn dt. So that would be changing charge. Uh, so it's going to turn out that there is actually an effect uh, that is like the second equation here. And I want to maybe explain in a second how, that, how we were led to that. Uh, but first, let me explain a bit about linear optics, because linear things in general are simple than nonlinear things. So how did people first try to, uh, you know, get an effect like this at the linear level? So the idea was basically, if you had a crystal that broke inversion, uh, maybe that can play the role of the electric field. So you would just get an effect linear in magnetic field. Um, that turns out sort of mostly not to be true, but uh, understanding how it happens was an interesting process that he taught everyone something about solids. So the goal was to find a chiral magnetic effect, which would be even simpler than a chiral anomaly. It would be a current in response to magnetic field. Now, uh, I think, I hope everyone agrees now that at equilibrium, this is zero. Um, in a magnetic field, your system can reach a new equilibrium with no macroscopic current. Um, there is an effect at non-zero frequency. Uh, so in other words, even in a valve semi-metal, this is still zero at equilibrium. There's nothing too bizarre, despite some old papers. Um, if you go to non-zero frequency, which means like oscillating the magnetic field, then there is a non-zero effect. Um, it's one of these cases where Q goes to zero and omega goes to zero don't quite commute. Uh, but what you get is actually just like optical rotation in a wave because an oscillating magnetic field requires you to have an electric field and then you're basically computing the response to a wave and you can compute this tensor, but it winds up being very simple. So even though this is kind of a lengthy expression, it's just a sum over bands integral over the Fermi surface of ordinary group velocity. The only new ingredient is this M, which is the orbital magnetic moment of the block electrons. And I want to tell you what that is because this is another example of this kind of low energy theory of metals needing, needing to be improved by something that is a little bit like, but different from uh, the Berry curvature. Um, but all of this is saying is that in linear response, linear optics, there is nothing very special about Val semimetals. This formula applies to Val semimetals, but it applies to other metals as well. Uh, and that's why we don't think it should be called the chiral magnetic effect. We should think it should be called the gyrotropic magnetic effect. But just to explain what this effect is, it's a very old effect. It's just, if you have a material that is kind of handed like quartz or selenium or chiral, and you pass light through it, then it rotates the polarization of the light just like the Faraday effect, but without magnetism. Um, so that's called natural optical activity, sometimes by optical experts. So where that comes from, the main reason I wanted to mention it here was first, you know, why do we have to go to nonlinear effects? Um, but even more, where it comes from is that even the group velocity in the equation of motion for a metal um, is a little bit incomplete and was revised in the 2000s. And if we'd known this uh, when we started, we could have saved ourselves quite a few months of time Basically, there is an object that is the orbital magnetic moment of a block electron, because remember, a, a block state is made from superposing atomic orbitals. Atomic orbitals can have orbital angular momentum, which means orbital moment. Um, therefore, the block state can as well. And it's actually just like the Berry curvature, except with an additional power of energy in the middle. And the, to be precise, the off-diagonal part of energy. Um, so if you never, I, I certainly never learned about the orbital moment of block electrons, but here it is. And the way it shows up in semi-classics is very simple. And it's there whenever you apply a magnetic field, there is a change in the velocity. Normally the velocity is the derivative of the energy. Uh, well, now the energy gets modified by this magnetic moment dotted into B, but the magnetic moment depends on K, which means there's an extra derivative. Um, so in any solid, the group velocity is modified in a magnetic field um, and that winds up being actually how any solid responds at low frequency to an electromagnetic wave. In semi-classics, it really responds to the magnetic part of the wave because the electric part averages to zero. And with just a couple lines of algebra, 
you know, we did, we have sort of an eight page supplemental material on the quantum calculation, but the you can get the right answer in two paragraphs using semi-classics once you realize that this is the term that matters, where by right answer, I just mean this formula uh, down at the bottom here, which I think several groups all agree on now. So that's an argument to go to nonlinear effects because linear effects, in other words, even if I took the very simplest model of a Val semimetal and computed that chiral magnetic effect, supposedly, I would get something that depended on the energy difference and was not very unique. Um, so now we go to nonlinear effects. And first, and this is the last part of the last serious part of the talk, uh, the first reason why you might be interested, even if you're more from an applied background, is that tantalum arsenide, which is kind of the benchmark Val semimetal, has extremely strong nonlinear optical properties. So if you look at this table, and this experiment was done by my colleague Joe Orenstein, um, and it was done without theoretical guidance. They just happened to be measuring and got an extremely strong effect without trying, but it's now verified by other groups. Uh, you find that tantalum arsenide's sort of intrinsic second harmonic response. So this is a, if you like a measurement of inversion breaking, you put in light at omega, light comes out at frequency two omega. Um, it's about 10 times larger than anything else in the first frequency range they looked at. And if they go down a little bit lower in frequency, it's about 50 times larger. Um, I don't actually think this is so directly connected to valness. In other words, I don't really think this response on this slide is topological. I think it just means that the material breaks inversion very strongly, which is why the vowel points are well separated. So it's, I guess, not a totally different thing, but um, I think what it's just saying is that tantalum arsenide, it's a metal, so you can't really talk about polarization, but you can say it has extremely strong inversion breaking. Um, and there's some more, detailed calculation one can do to kind of try to support that. Um, but now let's go to a different effect, which is a photocurrent effect. So we shine light and generate a current. And the idea is going to be go back to that chiral photocurrent or circular photogalvanic effect I talked about before and ask about what happens at a vowel point, because it's going to turn out that the answer is quite uh, elegant and simple. So the way that this is important experimentally is if you take vowel materials that are chiral, that are low symmetry, then in general, you will still have, you still have to have both positive and negative vowel points. So the total charge is zero, but they can be at different energies. Um, and in particular, you could have a situation where there's some energy splitting in the vowel points. And let's say for the inward directed or negative vowel point, uh, this transition doesn't happen because of poly blocking. So omega is the frequency of the light I'm putting in. And usually we think about optical effects at high frequencies in terms of transitions. So this transition doesn't happen. I will have some effects near the Fermi level, but those are the kind of semi-classical effects that we thought about 10 years ago. And we know that these intraband effects are very weak, barely measurable, in fact. But over for the positive vowel point, I will have transitions across. And now we can't really use semi-classics. Normally the rules for when you can use semi-classics to calculate something are uh, like for light at some frequency, there shouldn't be any significant changes in the Fermi surface over the range of frequencies uh, that we're studying. Um, but that's not the case here. So now we have to do an actual quantum calculation. But what we know is the way that topology works, um, even though the optical response starts off just involving the wave functions at some energies away from the vowel point, those wave functions know that the vowel point is there. In other words, I couldn't get rid of the vowel point um, without modifying those wave functions a lot because topology is stable. Um, so what we can do is start off with ordinary optical response between the lower state and the upper state and transform it into something that just measures the vowel charge. And I do have a couple slides, but I think, especially since it's late in the day for you all, I think that would get a little bit detailed. So let me just first tell you the answer and some related work. Um, and then I'll very quickly sketch derivations, but you can find those in the papers. Um, so the, the claim is that for a vowel point, um, if you look at the difference at which, the difference in the current injected by right circular light and the current injected by left circular light, so this is again a three-dimensional current injection, you get E cubed over H squared times the intensity of the light times the charge of the vowel point. Um, and it turns out that this is much larger, maybe 100 times larger than the intraband contribution. So again, you'll never measure quantization to one part in a billion. You'll be very lucky if you measure quantization to one part in 10. But it's true that the natural 
nonlinear optical response of a vowel point is E cubed over H squared. Uh, C is the speed of light in vacuum. Epsilon naught is the vacuum dielectric constant, at least if you have a thin enough piece of material. So it is a material independent quantum, but instead of E squared over H, it's E cubed over H squared. And now I wanna talk about the steps that led to the experimental observation of some of this. And that's basically a good note to end on, aside from one or two closing comments. Uh, so maybe the, the key steps, so we worked this out around 2017. Uh, and very soon afterward, and a material was found uh, different from the ones we'd proposed. This was found by Zahid Hassan's group that has, first of all, a sort of multifold vowel point and a pretty large gap between that point and the other ones that cancel it out to give total charge zero. Uh, so the other uh, maybe important enabling piece of work was done by this theory paper, um, which made sort of material dependent uh, predictions because Okay, it's true that when you're on the plateau, things are uh, material independent, but the range of frequencies over which you see the effect depends on the material, because the way this will work, you will see the response from one vowel point for some range of frequencies, but then once omega gets large enough that you get transitions across the other vowel point, they cancel out the first one and you get back to some very small effect. Um, so the main prediction from that theory paper was up to frequencies of about 0.7 electron volt in rhodium psilocyde, you should see this large effect, basically flat, and then it should tail off rapidly because you're getting transitions from the other vowel point. Um, so these are the slides I thought I would skip, which are the details maybe of, of why you get this quantized answer. Um, but it's not a very hard calculation. It's just sort of, again, transforming away energy denominators to get an expression in terms of very flex. So, I think at this point of the day, people probably care more about the experiment. Um, so here's the idea of what's done. Uh, it's all optical. You send in a burst of light. That creates a burst of current because this is a photocurrent effect and that current turns out to be directed into the sample. And then what you measure is the terahertz radiation from that little burst of current. Um, and it's hard to get an absolute magnitude. So it's hard to measure the E cubed over H squared and I'll argue that that you know, shouldn't be precisely quantized anyway. Uh, but what you can measure at least is the frequency dependence. Uh, and what you see is indeed that the drop off of something roughly flat starts almost exactly where it's supposed to start at around 0.7 EV. So we do think that you know, whatever one can say about magnitude, and I'll say a tiny bit about that in closing, uh, this effect is something that is sensitive to the charge of a vowel point and it becomes canceled out by the oppositely charged vowel points. I think that's the only uh, explanation of the frequency dependence that is seen experimentally, because this is not the way most nonlinear optical responses work. So one little calculation we did recently, or actually not that little, it's somewhat complicated, uh, was to try to understand interaction effects, because we know in insulators various reasons why things are not affected very much by interactions. Uh, I, I mentioned one of those in response to a question you can use this flux tri trick as we call it. So here, this is a semi-metal, so all bets are off. If you calculate the vertex correction, you get a number that is not particularly small. In fact, it's larger than the interaction correction in graphene because graphene is an example of how sometimes nature is lucky or bizarre. I, I told you that in graphene, you measure the fine structure constant to 1% accuracy or so, which is basically the non-interacting result. If you go and calculate the interaction correction, um, it should be in a sense of order, you know, 50% or something, but the coefficient in graphene is just a very, very small number. It comes out to be 19 minus six pi divided by 12 and six pi is almost 19. So a number that you would have expected to be order one is of order 1%. Um, if you do that same thing for vial semi-metals where now it's a nonlinear response, so things are more hairy, um, it's not particularly small. It's of order tens of percent and it has some frequency dependence. So we think that, uh, this E cubed over H squared is still the natural scale, but you ought to be able to measure interaction induced changes in it. Uh, so I think that's where I wanted to, to conclude aside from maybe one uh, closing comment and then I'll stick around a bit for uh, at least five minutes of questions. So um, maybe the, the general point is that we know that both insulators and semi-metals can have electromagnetic responses from topology that are quite unusual. Uh, and you can sort of organize them by powers of electric field. So the Josephson frequency and flux quantization are E over H or H over E. Um, there are a lot of E squared effects. Uh, 
all these transport effects and the graphene optical transmission. And then vowel points seem to be the first uh, E cubed over H squared effect, as far as I know. Um, and again, the magnitude, there is a group at Penn, uh, Liang Wu, that may be seeing uh, something like the expected magnitude in a different material. So there may be some progress there uh, soon to come out. So um, I guess, you know, one question was what else could there be? Well, by power counting, you know, it's hard to go up to higher powers of electric field. Um, you have to go to four dimensions or be clever about what you are measuring. So E cubed may be more or less the end of this list for standard experiments. But I do think there are a lot of other possible materials, families, and effects uh, in all three of these categories to find. Um, and then, yeah, there also are magnetic valve sum metals. I, I wasn't sure if there are going to be other talks on magnetic valve sum metals, but I thought I should mention that a very recent discovery is this cobalt tin sulfide is probably the clearest example of uh, a valve semi metal where instead of breaking inversion, you break time reversal. It has basically an Ising like magnet, and there's a very nice measurement of magnetic domains, uh, which turned out to be quite unusual if you're interested in uh, transport and magnetic materials. Um, one simple way to explain why this material might be interesting is that it is a very large Hall angle. Sigma XY over Sigma XX is uh, much larger than any other metallic material, as far as I know. Um, so this is what I said about domain walls. I think in the interest of time, I'll be quick, but basically there seems to be a, a broad crossover from linear type domain walls, which would be Dirac-like in the center because the magnetization is vanishing to more conventional uh, circular or block type domain walls as a function of temperature. And then uh, in my last minute, so I'm, I think it's great that this conference is still happening despite all the challenges this past year. Uh, I wanted to mention a bit about you know, how do these vowel semimetals and integer topological phases fit into kind of the universe uh, of topological phases? Because there are also fractional topological phases of electrons or spin or whatever, where the quasi particle is fundamentally changed. And that's an area where there has been a lot of progress, which I'm not going to talk about. There are some problems that are still hard, like whether there's a spin liquid on this so called Kagame lattice or in this material. Um, but a case where there has been a lot of progress is the triangular lattice. And there, I'm just flashing this up basically to try to motivate you if you don't learn everything that you wanted from these tutorials to go out and learn something on your own. So just on the triangular lattice antiferromagnetic Hamiltonian, pretty much every possible strongly correlated topological state has been proposed. And I do think there's recent progress on maybe understanding that it is the chiral spin liquid that is most stable, but that's uh, something that people argue about, so I wouldn't sell it that way. But basically, if you like topology, um, then some of the same things you learn for integer topological phases, you can also apply to these other topological phases where the electron breaks up. Um, so as uh, Sergio was kind enough to advertise, uh, we do have a book that just came out. Um, and one thing that I think is fairly new in this book is trying to present both the integer and fractional topological phases on kind of the same level and with the same language. Um, so with that, let me thank my collaborators for the research part and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Joel, for a very, very nice talk, tutorials. Uh, so we have time for questions now. Go ahead and type in. There is an attendee that uh, has raised the hand, Shaila Charma. Uh, hello, uh, this is Shelza. Yes, we can hear you. Hello, am I yes. audible? Yes, go ahead, ask your question. Uh, so I have a question uh, that when we study quantum oscillation in 3D topological insulators, uh, we say that uh, it arises because of the topological surface states related to pi berry phase. But at the same time, we are studying these properties in the presence of magnetic field. So uh, do the time reversal symmetries preserved for the topological surface states? That's a good question. So it's not perfectly preserved. So it's true that the magnetic field you apply to do the experiment um, does slightly break time reversal. So in principle, you would expect to see instead of pi, pi minus 0.01 or something like that. It turns out that it's quite a small effect though, because one way to understand that is, let's think about what is the energy scale of how a magnetic field modifies band structure. So one way that it will modify the band structure is through the Zeeman effect. Um, but the Zeeman effect, uh, <laughs> I see a nice question by an expert in the Q&A that I'll come to in a second. So uh, 
The uh, Zeeman effect, a typical scale would be one Kelvin for one Tesla. Uh, so one Kelvin is very small by the energy scales of band structure. Let's say that the gap in a 3D topological insulator is usually uh, at least a thousand Kelvin. So in other words, it's true that the magnetic field will modify the band structure and break time reversal, but that's usually an effect at kind of the, the below 1% scale, if that makes sense. So in this case, uh, is it uh, like, uh, is it um, good to say that uh, these topological surface states are still preserving the time reversal symmetry or? Uh... Um, I would say they're preserving it to a good approximation. It's no longer an absolutely perfect statement, but you know, another way to look at it is that often you're measuring in the Earth's magnetic field and that's slightly breaking time reversal. So, but yeah, it, 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 time reversal is a very good symmetry, but not uh, absolutely perfect once you have the magnetic field on, but it's, a, you know, like a less than 1% modification usually. Okay, thank you. So, sure. Uh, there's a question about strain. Uh, yes, so to visualize it in the lattice picture, usually to fully capture strain, you have to distort the lattice. Um, so it is possible to do like a little toy calculation in a tight binding model and see how strain in a vowel semimetal or different kinds of bending and so on uh, do modify the electronic structure and generate these sort of pseudo electromagnetic fields. But I think it's hard to do if you strictly fix the lattice. Um, so then there's a question, yeah, about what is hot and unusual of ferromagnetic and uh, of the domains in uh, cobalt tin uh, sulfide. Oops, uh, sorry, let me go ahead and To that. Um, yeah, so I, I think the uh, the main point I wanted to make about oops. Sorry, I'm somehow I'm gonna try and reshare because somehow I was getting a stop sharing. Uh, and if it doesn't work this time, then I'll say it in words. All right, so um, the idea is that there is a uh, secondary Ising type phase transition with nice critical phenomena behavior um, that is really a transition in the nature of domain walls once you've already established the uh, bulk magnetic order. So in other words, at about 175 Kelvin, um, you establish that it's an Ising magnet, ferromagnet out of plane in this sample. Uh, then as you cool down, you see that you go from uh, linear domain walls over some range, and then the, the data here, I mean, there are a couple of experiments, but uh, one of the things they measured is effectively the domain wall mobility. And there's this very big dip in that well below the phase transition up at 175 Kelvin. And it turns out that there's some old theory on this that maybe this material is the best example of, of how you can have a second phase transition in the nature of the domain walls, uh, in this case, between linear and circular. So that part, I would say is not so vowel specific, but the neat thing is the way that vowel fermions move in these domain wall con configurations is sort of interesting. Like for example, here, when there is a magnetic field, this material is vowel-like. When there's no magnetic field, it's Dirac-like. Basically the way that vowel, the, the reason why it's exciting to me as a theorist is um, the fact that you have these two different kinds of domain walls and can control them with temperature means you have different backgrounds for your vowel, different textures, I guess, for your vowel fermion to move in. And that's a way to maybe actually see some of these pseudo electromagnetic fields that people have talked about before. Um, so to me, at least that's uh, a little unusual. I guess the combination of uh, a very clear domain wall transition with the fact that the particle moving in them is sort of unusual. Um, so I guess the next question is, is it possible to measure directly um, the topological charge of a vowel fermion? Um, I guess, okay, maybe the question is what would we accept direct? Okay, I think we can accept that there are, for example, from the nonlinear optical experiment I showed, there is a signature of one sign from one point and then the opposite sign from the other point. Uh, 
separated by the predicted energy. I guess to actually measure the magnitude, um, I don't know yet that there is a very clear measurement um, that you could sort of directly interpret the way that we interpret, say, the pi Berry phase of topological insulator surface states or something like that. So uh, I'm not sure. I mean, that, that's why we wanted the magnet. That's why, I mean, maybe this pen experiment on the magnitude. Um, but I, I don't know that the topological charge of the Val fermion has been as directly measured as you would want. Uh, and then another anonymous question. Uh, so I think that the skew scattering, um, probably yes. Uh, so, okay, so skew scattering is electrons at the Fermi surface scattering off impurities and generating a Hall effect. And what seems to be true about some of the Val materials, um, at least this is true about the Dirac materials like cadmium arsenide, they seem to be very clean and have very long mean free paths. And in general, skew scattering does become the dominant transport contribution to sigma xy um, in very clean ordinary metals. So as far as I can tell, I think that would be true experimentally in Val semimetals as well. Um, so I think if you have a clean valve semimetal and you strain it, there will be various things going on. There will be interesting things related to the valve points, and then there will be things that are in ordinary metals like skew scattering. And I don't know off the top of my head why one would dominate the other or not. So I'm not seeing any more questions, but if anyone does uh, see one or have one, uh, please correct me. I think there is another one, no? In the the last one, that's the... Oh, yeah. Does the valve fermion have mass or spin? Well, uh, yeah, in, 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 so a, a valve fermion can't really have mass even in particle physics. And that's kind of a difference between the valve and the Majorana. Uh, particle physics, a Majorana uh, can have mass. Um, the valve fermion does have spin or at least pseudo spin of one half. Like maybe an, an easy way to understand sort of why the vial fermion is pretty stable is just think about the Hamiltonian uh, K dot sigma or P dot sigma, but you know, momentum in the Brill one zone dotted into sigma. So if you add any linear and momentum term to that, all you do is shift where the zero is, but you don't really modify the fact that that has a sort of outward directed flux of very curvature. Um, so the only way that the valve point becomes unstable is if uh, two of them smash together, like in a Dirac point. So you can gap a Dirac point, but you can't really gap a single valve point. You have to collide it with another one. So that's a restatement of the fact that you can't have mass at a valve point. You can't easily open up a gap. And the terms you would try to open up a gap, like for example, if you took graphene, graphene is just two components. It would be like px dot sigma x plus py dot sigma y you could gap that by adding sigma z type terms, but in the vowel case, those three, all three terms are already there. Um, so it's very stable. So I would say it has spin half and it does not have mass. Are there more questions? Um, so I didn't, I didn't even comment on type two valve semimetals. I didn't get into the details of structure. So very briefly, a, a type two valve semimetal is more metallic. It's like a type one valve point, but lying on its side. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure I know uh, what a type three valve semimetal is. Uh, or I mean, at this, yeah, there, there are many different possible fermionic uh, I mean, even a type one and type two are, are not that different in terms of the band structure. It's just the direction of energy, I guess. Uh, so I, 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 but I don't know. I mean, there, there is a classification of Fermi points from kind of a mathematical point of view. Uh, one is by Shinsei Ryu and Andreas Schneider and others, I think. And one is by like Peter Horjeva. Um, but I'm not sure how many of those are realized in solids aside from the type one and type two files. So if there are no more questions, uh, I have a question out of curiosity. What is the meaning of the uh, orange bird and the snake in your book cover? <laughs> well, the, yeah, the idea is uh, the, that cover is meant to be that the bird is contemplating uh, 
topology. And on the back, there's a bird looking at its reflection, which is a bird contemplating symmetry. Unfortunately, the problem is everyone knows that Roderick likes birds. So people tend to interpret the cover as Roderick is the bird and I'm the snake, uh, which is not, not my preferred interpretation. So it's intended to be that the bird is contemplating the fact that the snake is kind of wrapped up topologically. Uh, that's the approved interpretation. Uh, you we, thought we, yeah, we, we thought it, we should try something a little bit more unusual than the usual uh, you know, curve direct point or something like that. We thought that had been done. So at least if nothing else, it's at least distinctive. Yeah, that's very nice actually. Uh, so there's another question uh, you have in the Q&A. Uh, let me see. <laughs> uh, I, I, the, the, the book sort of, grew, the question is, am I planning to teach a class based on the book? Uh, if the department lets me, it's probably, I have, I, the book kind of grew out of lectures I'd given at schools and in Berkeley, um, but I, I don't think I'll be allowed to teach it next year. I think I have to teach undergrads, but thanks for the question, Omar. And when I have the chance, I'll try to teach the grad course again. Okay, I think that uh, we have reached uh, the point that there are no more questions and uh, we should probably close. Uh, thank you again. Uh, oh, there is another question that's popping up. <laughs> go. Yes, so uh, B squared terms are there in kind of nonlinear susceptibilities and things like that. Um, but as far as I know, if you just have a magnetic field and you're interested in, okay, so if you just have a magnetic field, Let's say I, I don't oscillate it because if I oscillate it, I would produce an electric field through Maxwell's equation. So statically in a B field, there are some fairly interesting nonlinear susceptibilities and things like that, but they're not really transport or time dependent effects. I think one, one fundamental difference between electric and magnetic fields, and this is sometimes called Bloch's second theorem, but it's not really a theorem. It's more like folklore. In electric fields, you don't reach equilibrium strictly speaking. There's a current, even if it's infinitesimally small. In magnetic fields, you can reach an equilibrium in the magnetic field. And in that equilibrium, there is no useful or macroscopic transport current. You can't really have a perpetual motion machine in a magnetic field. Uh, so you can have like a persistent current in a superconducting ring maybe, um, but you can't use that to transport energy. So I think with a, with a B squared term, you do get things like the Berry phase and the orbital moment and so on. And it, it, I don't want to say that it's not interesting. There is some nice work by uh, Qian Yu on B squared terms, but I don't think they will give you, you know, dn by dt, or I don't think they will give you currents or density changes in the same way. Again, that's folklore, not a proof. Okay, now I think uh, there are no more questions. And uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you. I thank you again uh, for this uh, beautiful uh, lecture and uh, for answering so many questions with uh, so much um, a nice detail and thoroughly. So I also want to thank uh, the other, the other uh, speakers of the tutorials if you are still out there. And uh, I will see you tomorrow uh, if you Oh, maybe you uh, you had to to be very very late in the afternoon uh, if you want to join uh, for you, Joel. If you want to join the the, the regular uh, talks uh, for the conference starting at, at 10 a.m. Uh, tomorrow, so I will see you there, and uh, hopefully, Joel, I will see you next year in the in Greece. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you. It's my pleasure. All right. Goodbye. <laughs>